How's it going, buddy? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can. Oh, now yeah. we can. Now we can. How's yeah. it going? Great. How are you? Yeah, good, man. Beautiful. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Managed, managed to get everything sorted? Yeah, everybody's downstairs getting ready to eat, so it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a nice big turkey and stuff ready? Is it just you that makes them bad? Is it like yourself or do you have some people helping you? I have me and two other people on my team. I have, it's a small company. It says, um, usually I'm off uh, smiling for people and doing chocolates on site, but uh, there's a team of total of four of us, uh, two that make chocolate, one that helps with logistics and then me. So <laughs> Nice. Beautiful. Like a little wolf yeah. pack. That's what you need. Yeah, and it, it allows us to adapt. I think that's one of the things yeah. that uh, the reason I keep the team small, both for both economic reasons, everybody is allowed to be compensated pretty well. But then also, uh, if we have to turn on a dime, I can put my hands on three other people quickly without a lot of uh, miscommunication. So. Yeah. Awesome, man. <laughs> that's yeah, my next, my next tour is South Africa. I want to go to. Um, there's a chocolate Ooh. and wine. <laughs> that's the whole in uh, South Africa that I'm interested in going to. So yeah. Down in Cape Town, like a chocolate wine mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yes. There's some good ones. <laughs> Waking up dog. Okie dokie. So good afternoon there, Robert Bowden from New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> but so it's so cool like I think we have so much to be thankful for in terms of like social media I know it gets a bad rap by lots of people but actually <laughs> I find it truly amazing but and and you know that's how I kind of met you I don't actually know how I started following you or what the story was on Instagram but yeah, uh, yeah I was like wow this guy's cool making like awesome <laughs> chocolates and stuff like that and then I think it was probably about three or four weeks ago, you posted something, you're like, oh, this is a little bit of a story about me. And, um, you know, have a read if you want to. And I took a read and I was like, huh, this guy's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. nice. I, uh, I started, um, yeah, it was kind of a, I, I think social media is what you make of it. I yeah. look at, it's a tool like anything else. And I think uh, you, you find what you're looking for. And so for people that find that it's really, really bad sometimes, I would say, go back and look at yourself and say, what exactly were you hoping to find this? So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty glad that you, you stumbled across mine. Though, so. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, you definitely have a, have a great story. And, and yeah, I'm really excited to chat to you. So I guess let's, let's kind of get into it, right? So you're probably not uh, the stereotypical type of person that <laughs> grew up in the deep south of the U.S. And yes. may, maybe you can take us back in time a little, what it was like as a sort of African-American farm boy growing up in Alabama. <laughs> Alabama is one of those places, it's utterly beautiful. It really is. I think uh, going back to things getting a bad rap, it was probably one of the prettiest places I've been. Um, culture is a bit interesting. Um, <laughs> it was very difficult in the sense that trying to explain how it's so juxtaposed and you have all of this great culture and these great experiences and then, but it still is peppered with these really strange and sometimes not pleasant uh, events. And so I think with me growing up there, I had a blast. I was kind of in a little bubble. Uh, again, being a, a black man from the South, I get immediately asked, especially now that I live in Jersey, uh, how was it or was it cold? And I said, no, not really. But I also realized I lived a sheltered life on the rural farm in the middle of nowhere. Um, and all of my neighbors were missing. So I think if I looked in any direction, seven houses either way, I was related to them somehow. So <laughs> I lived in a very fun, um, it was 200 acres, me and my horses. And so I just kind of did whatever. And I didn't realize the moment I left that area, it was vastly different. Uh, very, and not as pleasant for some people. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm aware of that. Wow, it sounds like a, a beautiful uh, space that you, that you had as a, as a youngster and on being on a farm, you, there's always something really special about that. Tell us a little bit about the, the kind of farming that your family was doing there. Um, we started, I 
I guess you could say it was more subsistence farming. We all did something and everyone had a profession and uh, my father had a trade as well as uh, every other member, but collectively we farmed together, whether it would be crops or cows or pigs. Uh, my particular interest was chickens. Uh, so we all provided resources to each other and you learn things. There was a, there was a very strong connection to our food source um, which I think a lot of people miss today. Um, there's a, a big disconnect how things get to your table. And so it wasn't a, an odd thing for me to process uh, animals or to harvest corn and harvest vegetables and work with my grandmother to do that. So I think that was something that I appreciate now that I didn't really think about as a child. It was just what you did. So uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, that's that's so cool. I think it's so important to to have that connection with nature and and the lessons you learn, like growing up on a farm and you know farming. Yeah. And, you know, it just it's just incredible, and and you don't realize it at the time. That's for sure. Yeah, I I definitely can say that I did not appreciate it when it was happening because I was that kid that had to go feed the animals before I go to school. And then you're like, oh, you're running to the school bus and like, did I get dirty? Do I have anything on me? Uh, it's those kind of things. Uh, I also realized that, yeah, I was, in retrospect, I guess we were considered poor, but I really never thought that. And we had everything we needed. And actually, in retrospect, I have probably more than most that thought they had more than I did. So... Yeah. Well, you might have been poor, but at least you only ate free range uh, organic exactly. produce. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my mother was the same stress, so she made my clothes. Like, I never thought anything negative about the fact that my mother made my clothes. I always thought, I have a designer in my house who can make things that I want. So I never, it's all about perspective. And so, uh, so yeah, I never really looked at it as a negative um, that we kind of did everything ourselves. Yeah. Awesome. And, and you mentioned your grandmother there and, and her, she had something like what, four fields or, or, or yes. three huge um, fields and they, they fed all four households. Yes. You know, how, how did kind of everyone muck in with that? What was it? You know, she you know? kind of, my grandmother was one of those people that was far ahead of her time in that she, she religiously, she knew the almanac, she understood heirloom seeds, she cultivated her own future crop seed. So there was never a, oh, is this a GMO seed? No, she had a harvest collection of satchels of seeds from the previous wow. harvest. And wow. um, so kind of like the younger kids were her, her crew. And so there was about four or five of us at any given time who uh, step here, don't step here, you plant this, you move that. And we went with her. So she kind of watched us while our parents worked. Um, but she taught us that, and we had, she taught us crop rotation. Uh, she taught us about understanding what the impact of what you're growing has on the environment and why you should move and no nutrients and rotate things. All of those things, I just kind of thought, oh, that's grandma telling us what to do. <laughs> but it's funny now how much research goes into understanding something she knew just like that. Yeah. So, so Robert, was that a lot of that just intuition and her experience or had she, mm -hmm. was she a reader or how, how did she actually? She did not study any of that. That was just life. That was, she said, you know, um, the things you need are in front of you if you are smart enough to look for them. And wow. so she was very, I guess, in common terms, simplistic in that way, but she taught us so many things about how to cook, how to preserve foods, how to, uh, process meat, how to farm. She taught us all of that because everyone in, from my parents and un aunts and uncles, they learned it from her as well. So it was one of those things that I didn't think a lot about it. It was just home. It was just what you did. Um, and it wasn't even until getting into Coco uh, recently and listening to the struggles that a lot of them have or a lot of the industry is trying to navigate now from seed production to um, just cultivation of property and land. She just knew. She knew, and I and I am ha so grateful that I learned those things, or at least that I listen sometimes. <laughs> um, I am thankful because this helped work wise. 
it has helped. Wow. You know, what's amazing to me with that is I think with farming, you actually end up having that generational um, knowledge being passed down probably in a better way than some sort of industries. You know, sometimes you just lose that information and, and sometimes the your granny or whatever might have so much knowledge and you just don't even realize if she's in something else, but farming, she totally passed it on to you. So that's, that's yeah. really great. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your, uh, your selling escapades when you <laughs> took some <laughs> eggs, went around as a young man. How did that all uh, come about? That was my first business. I, and I was small enough to climb into the chicken pens and so I could collect the eggs and, yeah. um, as as they grew, I got I got my first set of uh, I think every kid in the South it's Easter you get chickens. Well, currently there <laughs> seems to be this big stigma of giving pets as gifts, and I said you know every pet that I had was a gift, and it was my job to take care of that, and and so I did. I mean I had I raised them, and I think someone said oh they'll be dead in six months. Well I had them six years later. And, wow. and so I started raising chickens and well, you know, if you have one that lays an egg every day, that's fine. Well, if you have 10 that lays an egg every day, now you've got, to, well, I had about 200. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so there's 200 <laughs> eggs popping out on a regular basis. Uh, what do you do? Um, so I was about maybe seven or eight and people would, I would just collect the uh, empty egg cartridges that people had when they shopped. And I would, Sometimes I would take them in a bucket. Sometimes I would, uh, I learned how to wash the eggs and get them ready and store them. Uh, and then I started selling them for 75 cents a dozen. And um, <laughs> if I had known free range eggs would be a thing, I probably would have stayed in business. Um, but uh, yeah, 75 cents a dozen. I was, I mean, you're eight years old. You're, I could buy anything I wanted with that. So um, I did that and it was great. And it taught me a lot about uh, the whole supply chain. Like I had to take care of the chickens. I had to take part of my profits to feed the chickens again. Uh, I eventually started buying my own little generic uh, egg cartons. Um, it taught me all about delivery and expectations and um, customer service. Cause when you're eight, you don't have a car and you don't, you have to like walk to these things. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. I liked it though. I wouldn't regret it at all. And I, I told him glad that I did it. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like so much fun. I swear. Like <laughs> I can only imagine you in the morning waking up and like you've got yes. all the guys and girls running around. Did you? And they're <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> did you name your chickens by any chance? Of course. Um, I named them all. And, and people are how, how can you tell them apart? I'm like, I just knew they were my pets. And so, um, so cool. they all had character and they all, um, I knew based on like their habits, some had nests scattered, they hid them some were just right out in the middle of the field. So it, um, it taught me a lot about animal husbandry and how to be responsible. I will say that a lot of my uh, ethics and, and things from that, because there's no one there watching you. It's, you know, it's you in a field and you, you have to do it. There's no, there's, even my parents were busy doing their thing. So I was just expected to do, and you do. And so, um, so yeah, it definitely shaped how I view business now. It uh, definitely shaped how um, my understanding of resources and supply and demand. And and I was probably doing that, again, when most kids were playing and, and coloring and things. And so, yeah, I, it just, it was great. And I totally am happy that my childhood was like that. And so... That's why I always tell people, I'm so glad to be from Alabama. I probably wouldn't live there again, but, <laughs> but growing up, it taught me so much. Yeah, uh, That's right. really, really nice. And you mentioned your folks now. So do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about your folks? I know you mentioned your mom. She was a seamstress and, and you know, tell us a bit. So about uh, my mom well. actually was a, like both my parents were entrepreneurs. I think that is very uh, crucial or critical to how I view uh, work and how I view my life. So uh, my mom worked for the University of Alabama when I was growing up and then, but her personal, her passion was uh, clothes making. So she sewed, uh, she did a lot of custom garments for people and that was her business. And then, um, and so when she retired from the university, she did that full time. 
uh, my father was a carpenter. So after training horses and getting a family, uh, he started furniture and woodworking. And so my second official job was working for my dad's carpentry business. Um, and I think that level of, again, you I was a detail guy. I was small enough to fit into the cabinets. I could touch <laughs> and adjust things. And so it taught me the importance of nuance. It taught me that. But uh, yeah, but both my parents, uh, again, from Alabama, um, they were pretty, I'm an only child. So it was just me and them. Um, and, and I think that work ethic wise, my dad always said, you work till the job is done, not to Friday, because when you work for yourself, there's no one standing to pay you a check just for showing up. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I learned quickly that you have to do everything. You have to work and you have to complete it. And I think that keeps me from the perfectionist gap that a lot, that a uh, trap that a lot of entrepreneurs fall into where they're so focused on um, it being perfect and being right. My father was like, it has to get done. You've done it enough, trust the process, do the work. And I think um, that is probably, um, that and his, his love of life uh, are two of the things that I took from him most. He was just mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, uh, he lived life on his own terms and he wasn't really concerned with what other people did. And I think growing up through the civil rights movement, both my parents were, um, came of age during the civil rights movement in Alabama. So they were in the first integrated classes of schools. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very, I, I was always, Always aware of that, and then, yeah, of the world, and so yeah, so it was pretty fun. I um, I that my parents were pretty cool. I will I will say I had some pretty awesome parents. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. You know, um, you learned obviously so much entrepreneurial, but I can imagine also just with the woodworking that it would have helped with your career later on, with your ha working with your hands and yes, you know that just right. um, being creative and stuff as well, which which we'll come to you in a little bit. So, yeah. um, at the age of twelve, you actually realized something about yourself. Um, you realized that you like boys. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about um, that realization. That realization. <laughs> um, it sort of kind of happened. It was one of those passing things. Like um, I went to, a, I was in a, a boy choir. I was in a, like an all boys uh, boy in music school. So music and arts were also my thing. Both my parents sing and dance. And so that was just kind of around our house. So music was a thing where it's kind of funny, you have this huge farming community and then there was dancing and music. And so, yeah, we had fun. Um, <laughs> uh, so our going out was like moving the coffee table and turning up the radio and we just had fun. <laughs> so, uh, but what about, about the time I was about 12, I remember I had a friend who was like, oh, well, he's cute. And I don't think I'd ever thought that about anything. It was just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and it just, that was literally kind of it. It was like, oh, hmm. But I had horses to show and I was a competitive horse rider at that point. And, and I remember thinking, I was like, well, I kind of like this guy. I'm not really sure what that means, but he's nice. And uh, it just kind of like went away and not so much I didn't stop thinking about it. But it was just, I was so busy doing other things. It's like, oh, well, I'm showing horses and I'm traveling. But I remember thinking then that I was like, yeah, I'm more interested in guys than I was in uh, girls because I really wasn't interested in anything at, up until that point. It was just, you're busy. And, um, and so people always ask, did it bother me or, or was I worried about it? It's like, not really. It just never, it was just a thing. And so, um, so yeah, it, it kind of happened and I, I worry sometime or I used to worry sometime that my whole realization and even my coming out experience was kind of lackluster <laughs> it was uneventful it was just it's robert and you know that was that so <laughs> did, did you so you just like you didn't feel any pressure or anything like that whatsoever no i mean because we weren't um and maybe it's because i was an only child or maybe it was because my parents kept me busy with things and i was interested in so many things um that I knew what my friends were doing or they were starting to do. And, and there was this girl that I was really close to, but I can't, uh, 
I mean, it wasn't, it was like, you know, you're in elementary school. <laughs> it's, but <laughs> as far as, um, from the moment that I, I knew I liked anything in particular, yeah, it was just kind of, well, this is what I like. Um, I remember my mom talking to me about um, dating in general. It was just a long before I ever came out to her or, or even had that conversation. But it was just, she says, Robert, you're going to be hard to get along with anyway, so I'm going to teach you how to take care of yourself so that if you don't find anybody, you're fine. <laughs> and, uh, okay, I think that's good. <laughs> but yeah, so people always ask, like, I cook and I do all these things and I can sew and do stuff with my hands. I'm like, I just remember my mom thinking, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone that'll put up with you. So we're just going to make sure you can take care of yourself. So, I think that's, yeah. that's great advice anyway for like yeah. teaching kids, you know, just be okay with who you are at first and, you know, and, and be independent first. Yeah. And I, and I think that is true. I have a lot of friends who I really do believe are in relationships out of codependency. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's healthy at all. I don't, I don't need anything from a partner. Um, I'm glad for the partner that I have. And, but I think we complement each other because we're perfectly functional individuals. Mm. That's really important. And, and so, so when you actually told your parents, like, you know, that, that you liked other men, was that a, yeah. was that like a awkward moment or? It was more awkward because of school. And I remember thinking, um, and I had mentioned this earlier that I went to college to be a theater major. So, um, and again, I'm in the South of Alabama. And I remember we were working through an acting course and they always talk to you about tapping into your feelings and finding um, what causes you to feel these emotions and, and events. And so I remember sitting around in the circle and I mean, it's theater majors. There was a high concentration of guys that were, that were gay and even lesbians. And, and everyone had these stories. They had these fascinating, sometimes painful, sometimes funny uh, stories about their experience or, or dealing with the pressures of feeling one way, but knowing they shouldn't or thinking they shouldn't feel that way. And they had these, some had some really painful coming out stories, whether they had been uh, disowned or kicked out or all of this. So when it came my turn, I mean, I wasn't in, everybody knew that I was gay. And so um, I didn't have the story. I didn't have, I hadn't even said anything. It wasn't a, I had moved all the way from, you know, all the way through high school. And I, there were guys that I was interested in and guys that I'd gone out with. It was just never a thing. Um, and so I remember coming home and I said, uh, it was one of one of the breaks. And I just said, well, okay. And, and I didn't tell either of my parents that I was telling the other cause I, so, so I talked to my dad and I don't even know if he ever told my mom, but I talked to my dad first and it's like, so yeah, um, and you know, we're at the bar, <laughs> we're at the horse bar, and so it's kind of, so yeah, so there's this guy I like, and he's like, okay. And so I just, and I kind of waited for a second, and I was like, yeah, um, so I like him a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, and then he's like, he just he, he drank coffee all the time. He had coffee and a cigarette in his mouth, and says, is this supposed to be news? <laughs> and I really didn't have a response. <laughs> like, oh, is this supposed to be news? And he put out a signal. And then I said, I guess not. Okay. And I went back to feeding horses. And that was <laughs> that was that. Oh, uh, cool. And then so I went uh it was a little later, uh actually that I told my mom. And because I thought, well, surely he'll tell her and it'll, you know, whatever. And so I didn't tell her right then. I did uh, tell her later, and it's funny because my mom's my best friend and we, you know, she's still here and it's great, but I remember kind of just having a boyfriend and bringing him home and so on and so forth. And she was just like, well, as long as you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> and I was like, I, again, I didn't have a response. I was like, okay. And, but I remember going back, uh, after that realizing that a it wasn't anybody's business but my own and as long as i was okay with me that's really what was important um and then but two yeah we don't all it's perspective it really really is um i mean it could have gone tragically different it could have 
Um, and, I, and I'm aware that my story is in a lot of people's story, but I also know that I'm pretty fortunate for that. And it taught me a lot about understanding and accepting myself first and not feeling the need to either way be what someone expects or have an experience that someone else expects when I'm just me. So, yeah. Awesome. That's a cool story. That's not, that's nice that your parents were, you know, they're like, yeah, cool. Of course you're our son. We love you. doesn't matter. That was the thing. And they, yeah, and that, I think that was, the, both of them told me they love me and that they were proud of me. And, and I do, that's what I remember from both of those conversations was, you know, we're your parents, you're our child. We love you. And, and I wish that is something that I do wish more people stopped and thought about. You have brought a life into this world. Mm -hmm. um, it is your job to nurture, raise, uh, and support that life. And, and getting caught up in semantics that really have no, nothing to do with you. Um, I think that's kind of short-sighted when we're talking about uh, humans and we're all different and we all have unique things that we can bring to the table. So uh, I, I wish more people looked at it that way. Mm, yeah, so do we, that's for sure. So, yeah. so you went to, uh, like you said, you went to sort of theatrical school or university. Um, what, what was it that you were like um, majoring in or studying in particular? Was it, is it something specific or is it like a general kind of degree? It's going to be sad. I, I knew that I needed to go to college. I wasn't really concerned with what. <laughs> um, I knew that I would never use my degree. I think that's what I, I think learning, uh, going back to growing up working for, like with my parents, I knew that college degree was something I needed. Um, as my mom said, college teaches you how to navigate life. What you study is what you are interested in, but it teaches you the college experience should teach you how to navigate life. Hmm. So I took it for that not so much, you know, what particular field. I mean, again, I majored in theater. Uh, and, but what I also knew is that I would do something for myself, whether that was horses or music or something that I would do. And neither of those things required you to have a degree to be successful in. So I said, find something that you do easy, that you enjoy, that will make college as painless as possible um and yeah so i mean i my college classes was rehearsal or dancing and studying <laughs> dialects and cultures so yeah it's fun happy yeah, days that sounds really interesting yeah mm -hmm. the, the dialects and culture part and all that is is like you say learning about life as well so you you yes. are, sounds like you've got so much life experience, you know, from the farm and from your studies, which is, is really cool. So, yeah. uh, you know, after college, then you actually became a professional uh, horse trainer and mm -hmm. uh, had a pretty successful career that spanned sort of 20 years. Mm -hmm. So was that how something? That <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> um, so, you know, as, as one gets approaches the end of college, you are starting to either apply for jobs or internships or how exactly are we going to, um, what are we going to do next? And I had it all planned out. All of my other classmates were running off to New York City to be professional dancers or actors or going to California. Um, I've always been practical. I think practical is, practical and efficient is how my boyfriend describes me. Um, <laughs> but I said, you know, if everyone's going to New York, what happened to the people that went to New York last year and the year before that? And the year before that, and I, my mom said a statement. She says, Robert, no one goes to New York City to be a secretary. But there are a lot of secretaries in New York City. <laughs> um, so I thought about that for a while. I thought about how I was going to audition and what I was going to do. Um, and while I was in that process, I'm still competitive as an amateur showing horses. I rode with my father uh, and, and godfather. And... At a competition, uh, this guy asked, um, would I be willing to turn professional? Um, and it came with a job offer and a relocation package, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, I took it right on the spot. And uh, that's how I became a professional horse trainer. Wow. Awesome. That's cool. So you had a love for horses like from an early age with your dad. Eh? Always, yeah. Mm -hmm. My dad was a trainer long before I was in the picture. Uh, and then and he kind of settled down, I guess you could say, to start a family. But horses was something I was always interested in. And so 
it was quite easy for um for me to get back into that with him and so from the time I think I got my first horse at 10 maybe um but I'd been riding before then and so I got my first horse at 10 started competing and that was my weekend that's kind of also why I wasn't too concerned with boys at the time is I was busy showing horses or doing music or traveling and so uh I knew that I needed a job that paid for my horses. Well, if you're going to pay me to ride horses, then that's even better. So that's kind of how it was like, well, this is where my paycheck would have gone. But now that you're going to pay me for it and I get to ride all of these horses. So that's great. Wow. That's what amazing. a great way to, to actually do things in life is to try and combine the two, isn't it? So, so what, is the, what does it take to be a professional horse trainer? patience um a lot a lot more patience it's not a i will say it's a skill you either have or you don't you can learn technique you can learn um methods but you have to love it you really do um i've met a lot of horse trainers that hate their job and i don't understand it's a very difficult job so i'm thinking if you don't like it why do it. Um, but I look at that with anything. If I don't like it, I don't do it. Um, and so I think it takes a lot of patience. Um, I learned a lot. Um, it taught me about, uh, just to give a brief aside into horses, uh, horses are used in uh, reparative therapies, both for PSTD, PSD, and as well as um, because they reflect your behavior. So um, I don't think people pay attention to the fact that horses are prey animals, they're a food source. So they're very aware of their surroundings and they're very, they adapt really quickly. Um, so when you're using a horse in behavior therapy, um, people are, you'll hear some people, oh, horses don't like me or, or, or I'm, you know, they're afraid of me or no, they're responding in kind. So it makes you take a good look at yourself um, and learning how to manage both your emotions, uh, manage your habits, uh, because every time you interact with a, a horse, you're creating a habit. So I always say, are you creating a good habit or a bad habit? Um, and I think that's a life lesson as well as a horse lesson. Um, but, but yeah, so it takes a lot of patience. That being said, um, it, there are good horse trainers and then there are successful horse trainers and they're not always the same thing. Uh, so my goal was to learn how to be both. Uh, and I think uh, that kind of steered where my career went is, you know, I learned how to be a good trainer first. And then I said, well, how do I make a living at that and make it uh, profitable at the same time? Robert, can you maybe just clarify what sort of type of, what type of training it was like? A, yeah. I train, uh, actually, since you guys are from South Africa, uh, saddlebreds and Tennessee walking horses. So uh, American saddle horses and Tennessee walking horses um, are a light breed. They're kind of, I, I work with the riders. I work with um, teaching them disciplines for the horses from everything from driving to uh, not so much speed. We're not about speed. It's more about style. So we have a form. We have an ideal. And our goal is to train each horse for that breed standard. And um, so that takes a lot of repetition and a lot of practice and a lot of, um, again, patience. You have to be able to assess what you have. You know, every horse isn't a show horse. Every, just like, you know, every person isn't a star athlete. And that's okay. Um, the key is finding what is that horse good at and then making them the best at that. And so I think that's what allowed me to be a good horse trainer was being able to except this is the animal that I have in front of me. Now I can either fight with him to make him something he's not, or I can focus on what, on what he is. He's happier. I'm happier. And we're more successful. Yeah. That, so it makes so much sense. We play, play towards the strengths and that's, that's super cool. Another, yeah, another always, good laugh yeah. lesson. And yeah, exactly. so what, what is, what does it actually involve? Like, what do you actually, what kind of training are you actually doing? What does the actual process involve? It's a lot of rhythm. Um, it teaches going back to patience and time. Um, the gait that I train for is a four beat gait. So I was use the term, I uh, think of dancing. So you have 
uh, Foxtrot, um, it's four beat, it's steady. Then you have a canter, which is a waltz. It's a three beat gate. So, um, so the rhythm that you have to have, you have to feel in your body, um, you convey that to the animal. The horse can feel your muscles. So think of the horse as an extension of your legs. And it's a lot of riding and a lot of non-fun. I think people always think horse training is exciting. It's a lot of methodical movement, very uh, premeditated, um, learning how to be focused with all the distractions um, and learning how to slow down and just ride and get out. Uh, I don't ride in an arena. I don't practice in an arena. I perform in an arena. So to me, getting out in nature, uh, riding through the woods uh, where you might see birds or animals or leaves, whatever. I, there's so many distractions and I won more competitions because my horses could stay focused than I have just because they're the most talented horse in the ring. Uh, usually, um, the great the great ones are not always great. They're great sometimes, uh, but if I could be consistent, I could beat them all the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Makes and, so and sorry to bore you with random horse stories. I, no, I no, it's, 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 it's it's interesting for us because I really liked how you said they like you form a sort of great relationship with them and you know they, they understand where you're coming from they can pick up your feelings can you you know can you maybe go into the sort of type of relationships that you have with a, a horse yeah. Yeah. um i think that uh, a lot of times people think you can make a horse do something you can't make it's a 1500 pound animal it's a thousand pounds more <laughs> you know you the, the thing is you convince a horse that what you want to do is what it wants to do um and that's what I meant about patience. Like <laughs> one is different um, and they have just as varied personalities as people do. Um, some are straight to business. They want to be taught something, they're going to do it and then they're going to be done. Some, there's a meandering course. Uh, you just kind of figure out which one. And a lot of the times um, I spend more time learning how they like to learn as opposed to teaching. Um, mm. And so I, um, I grew up figuring out when I'm, okay, this, I didn't have the luxury of, oh, I, if I don't like this horse, I can just get another horse. So you learn to work with it. <laughs> um, oh. and, and I think that, such, that circumstance taught me that you can't just throw it away because it isn't easy and you can't, can't force it because you have a, you know, I think uh, some people have, they have their style. I'm like, my style adapts to whatever the horse is. Um, oh, that's and cool. It, it, why am I fighting myself? I'm like, they're stronger than me. They can run off. They can kick. They can do whatever they want to do. Or we could go out and have fun and then um, <laughs> and enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's training horses. It's like if you have a bad day training horses, same with chocolate. If you have a bad day, that's on you. <laughs> that really is on you. <laughs> it's, so funny. it's funny you you're talking about the relationship with uh, with horses and how intuitive they are actually in reflecting you um just a, a brief anecdote that i've seen uh, i'm a chiropractor and uh, a lot of i used to work in an area where there's a lot of dressage and a lot of people would do dressage and mm -hmm. oftentimes they would come in to me and say i need i need to get checked i need an adjustment and i said oh so you know what's going on or whatever and they'd say, oh, no, no, I have no pain or anything, but my horse is not, it's like the horse is not listening anymore. It's, or it's walking. Uh, oh, yeah. uh -huh. But they say, I must be out of whack because my horse is not, you know. And then uh -huh. so that, that was when I really understood yes. like, geez, these horses totally feel what's going on in the, in the yes. human being body. It's, it's really interesting. Yes, it really, and that's why um, even, even if you don't ride, that is why working with horses is great um, for man managing both. Um, there's an understanding that you have to come to um, to do it well. And, and I think that is the key phrase is doing it well. You have to, uh, the horses don't care about a blue ribbon and the horses don't care about your work day or what you were doing before. Um, it forces you to laser it that way. Um, and going back to your body being aligned, yeah, your muscles, I can, I can communicate with this horse without ever really moving. They can tell. 
Mm. And so I think that is, um, I think that is the key is that you have to be willing to listen um, mm. and, and, and understand a language that is not being verbally spoken. So um, look at what's happening with your horrors. That's why uh, you become very well aware of, I must be doing something. Something as simple as ref left-handed, right-handed, I'm, I'm ambidextrous. So uh, I started out being left-handed. Um, and it's funny, I think uh, school-wise or um, culturally, I had more issues being a left-handed person than I had being gay. Um, so uh, <laughs> another feeling of changing the fact that I yeah, wrote with my left hand, and that would seem to be this big to do. Um, but as a uh, because uh, most people are predominantly right-handed, I was able to balance horses because my left hand was stronger. Uh, but also because I was ambidextrous, it kept a balance mm. with how I trained. Yeah. Wow, subtle thing, but the nuances. <laughs> <laughs> and is uh, do you like consider the horse industry like cool at all? Because you yeah, I guess some stories and you know every that's like asking are there parents that abuse their kids? Yes, mm. are all okay. parents bad? No. Um, same thing with horses, same thing with an industry. Um, I love what I do. I practice really hard at it and I'm committed to the animals. Are there people that want a shortcut? Sure. Just like there are people who are bad trainers who don't take the time to listen, who um, there's that within anything. Um, and so I said, rather than being preoccupied with those that are negative, I want it to be a good example of how it's done well. Um, and let, uh, let my product speak for itself. And, and I knew I, I was well aware of there are people who I knew took shortcuts or, um, or were just not good to their horses and they, you don't last long. If, if this is, if this animal is your livelihood, one of two things, they'll get tired of you eventually. <laughs> they will. Um, <laughs> And, and I have seen horses lash out. I have seen um, people get attacked. I've seen it. And, and several, I'm just like, well, it was bound to happen um, because of X, Y, Z. So yeah, so I think um, there's, a, there's something that I learned about being a competitive horse trainer or just being competitive in general. It's always cheating until the slowest person catches up. <laughs> think about nitrous oxide think about clap skates think about any advancement in sports the moment it's an advancement it's considered cheating until the slowest person catches up mm -hmm. it's just is mm -hmm. what it is um and so again it's a tool methods or tools um you can't live off of any one tool it's a combination of those things and understanding technique and understanding purpose. Um, you know, I taught a class to some ladies uh, when I first got to Jersey and it was a clinic and I said, well, I'll come in, evaluate your horses, we'll give you some suggestions. And this lady wanted her horse to perform or have a different gear and gait. And she wanted all these changes. And she says, well, you ride. And I was like, sure. And I rode it and it behaved differently. And she's like, I wanted to do that. And I said, I'm designed to make it look good. That doesn't mean that it's going to be good for you. Um, I can do this with anything, but that's what I perfected the last 20 years of my life doing. If your horse is just going to be a companion animal that's going to go trail ride through the woods and over the mountains, you don't need it performing like a stadium jumper or an arena. That's not what you need. And I said, also, you forget for the time that it's in an arena competition, that's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, as opposed to you riding this all day or going for the rest of your life. So my job is to make that horse look phenomenal for 15 <laughs> minutes. That's a very different goal than if I'm just going to go ride. I wouldn't do half the stuff that I do if, if I was just going to go out and get on my horse and I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, that's, that's a very different method. And so... I try to instill that in my, in people that I've mentored or is both in horses or anything else, understand why you're here, understand what your purpose is, and then create your systems around that. If you do that, then I think you can be a lot more um, 
more methodical and more purposeful in your action as opposed to just doing the latest trend or what you saw someone else do figure out what your goal is and then work toward that and if you do that i think your success rate is a lot higher 100 percent. i love it there's so many lessons there <laughs> and uh, <laughs> So Robert, it, it may, it, you, you were there for 20 years, like as a professional trainer and, and it became some sort of circumstance made it implausible for you to carry on. Why was that? Um, well, the industry changed. Um, the industry evolves like anything else. And we went through a wave both um, economically. Um, my client base was not affected uh, because if you're, you know, like the upper end of the market was not really touched with the whole uh, economic issues of 2008. Uh, and then the lower end wasn't really affected. The middle group, I always call the two-parent household that's working and Susie wants a pony. Yeah, the pony had to go. <laughs> um, so, uh, but what I did learn is that when I left, um, I moved to Jersey. I was in Tennessee at this time. I've been training for about 20 years. Uh, when I went to Jersey, I wanted to continue doing that. And what I realized is that the climate and the sense of the customer and the expectations were vastly different than what I was used to. Um, there wasn't a real outlet for it. I would have had to continue going south or east, or sorry, south or west to, um, to compete. I would have to continue doing all of those things. So why would I live a good 15 hours north of where uh, my competition is? Um, the, the idea around training horses was just vastly different. And so uh, the laws in New Jersey, um, because I realized New Jersey for it to be the garden state is not real agriculturally centered. So um, like you can get fined for your horses being outside in the rain uh, in what? New Jersey. Yes, uh, you can um, <laughs> have to have, uh, you have to have a, it's called a, a plan of a plan of action to deal with horse manure in the field. And I'm like, it's outside in a pasture, but I have to <laughs> go get it and take it somewhere. It was <laughs> dog food or something. <laughs> yeah, there was so much. I'm like, who wrote this? And did they ever have a horse? And, you know, but that's where I am. And then, um, and everyone seems to think that you could just, oh, well, I'm going to send my horse to Robert today and he's going to train it and that's all it needs. Mm, mm. And that was a problem because, A, that's not how it works. Um, but there were a lot of people who were selling um, short-term fixes where, oh, well, you can, I'll ride your horse for two hours and it'll be fine. And I'm thinking, mm, not so much. Mm -hmm. So um, I realized I could, uh, for, for a year or two, I designed horse camps and, and worked in the Poconos and the mountains and did that for a while. And then I realized that um, the industry was changing. There was a lot of legislation, speaking of cruelty, there was a lot of legislation with the government on um, the inspection process and, and how uh, and, and all of that. And there was some good changes and some, some bad changes. And I thought, you know what, Robert, you've had a good run. I've done this 20 plus years, and I was at the top of my game for 10 of those. Um, I came off of a two year undefeated streak, <laughs> and I thought eventually someone's gonna beat me. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> every dog has his day. And I had mine, and I won numerous world championships for it, and had a great time. And I thought, you've done it. Now, what are you gonna do? What's next? <laughs> and so um, I said, I wanted to go out on top. So I, I stopped before uh, I started losing. Um, so I'm still, you know, I still have that. And figured, well, you have other abilities, you have other skills, what's next? And, and that's kind of how I started looking for my next career. Oh, that's brilliant. And that leads very nicely into our next question about being the current times. Uh, obviously, you've got a, a wonderful business that you run. Uh, making handmade chocolates. Uh, the company is called Vivere. I, perhaps uh, mm -hmm. the pronunciation yes. <laughs> I wasn't sure about. It's a um, <laughs> You took a couple of years off uh, as well, and you sort of 
wanted to try different things and experiment. Uh, can we just explore that, that time frame as well? Yeah, I think um, the first thing that people get is what gets them into a bind when you're starting a business or creating something is the necessity for it to be successful. Um, that will greatly affect how you develop your business. Um, and so what I wanted to do as I had, um, I'd saved enough that I could like stop for a while and go, oh, what are you good at? And I, you, you make a self-evaluation, you make a list. These are the things that, you know, you're good at. Um, now what can I make a living at just because <laughs> I'm good at it? I, I thought about that for a while. Um, I'm a strategist. What you learn to be in as a horse trainer and both as an entrepreneur for my parents, you learn how to strategize and, and pick your niche and all of those things. So I was good at that. And I thought, well, maybe I can apply that to people who are interested. Um, and so I, I would be a consultant. People would come talk to me about their business um, and what they're trying to accomplish. And then I would say, well, here's what I see. Um, this is what I think you can do. Um, but I also need to know what are your goals? The first thing I always ask uh, the person is, what are your goals and who's going to pay for it? And if you can figure <laughs> those two things out, that determines how you market. So I did that for about a year or so. Uh, and one of the people uh, coming to my place was a chocolatier. He was a family friend um, of my partner's. And, and I thought, well, I was fascinated. I was fascinated with business. I'm a foodie. I mean, you don't, but you don't have a lot of time to grow and cook when you're training horses on the road. So mm. I had these ideas. A lot of them actually were from my grandmother, things that she made. And so um, one of the first things I did when I went back home was I talked to my aunt and I said, do you have access to all of her recipes? And she said, yeah. yeah. So I went and just started furiously writing them down and taking snapshots of them. Uh, so I wanted to not lose that. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so I worked for about two years where I tried a couple of things. Um, I did consulting. I wanted to open a workspace. I was ahead of the co-workspace time about 2012 or so, maybe. I thought I would open up a co-workspace. Wow. And I was like, it was needed. Uh, and there were not a lot of places for uh, individual professionals to go that wasn't Starbucks to have a meeting. <laughs> and I said, well, or if you don't want to work in your home, but you need a virtual office. So um, the house that I have, the one that's up for sale, was used to be a doctor's office. It's a huge home. And so I had multiple offices. And um, I tried that for a while, could not rent it for anything. No one's like, who wants a shared office space? That was not the thing at the time. <laughs> it is, oh, well, you know, and, and I lived in a fairly rural area. So I thought, well, all you have is Panera and Starbucks to have a business meeting. And there's some things you just don't need to discuss sitting next to, you know, the mommy and me club, but you just don't. Mm. <laughs> so I thought for a while, I tried it. I did. I tried for about a year and a half. I was determined the co-work space is going to be a thing. Just trust me. And oh, no. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I said, well, I, I have the space designed for it. Um, I went back to, I'm still making things with chocolate, just trying things. And, um, the business that I have, I had actually started working, uh, researching for this guy that I was helping and I wrote the business model. I laid it out and it was sitting there and it was like, I created this business and I was convinced that it would work for someone else. And I thought, why don't I give it a go? Let's, let's test my own theory. Uh, and that's how I got in the chocolate business. I was literally, I was sitting there. I failed at trying to make a co-work space a thing because, oh, it's, no one's going to do that. And then um, I consulted for a while and I realized I didn't want to spend my life doing other people's businesses. I love business. I love the art and, and game of business and finding something that is a, a solution to someone else. I think that, that's fun. Um, and so I just, I kept kicking it around. I looked at, I, it was a complete business program that I had laid out and I, and I said, well, try it, Robert, just try it. And so I went back to the guy that uh, taught me about chocolate. and said, will you teach me how to, you know, make flavors? Will you teach me about um, formulation and all of these sorts? And he said, sure. And that's uh, that was about six years ago, five years ago, and here we are. That's so cool. 
I've got I've got like a, a, a bit of a double barrel um, question for you. Okay. So did you like enjoy cooking as a youngster as well as all those other things you did? And how important do you think it is to go into a business that you like, it's your passion? Um, the first, I think, yes, I did. I, I made things. I was, um, I was in 4-H uh, as a child. I don't know if it's 4-H in South Africa. Do you have, do you understand what 4-H is? 4-H no, is no. like this. Uh, it's a children's agricultural program. Um, it's, I think I pushed my head to greater thinking, my um, heart to greater learning, my hands to helpful living, and my health to greater giving. And so there's a, there's a whole four thing. Anyway, so it's four things. And it tells you about everything from being a consumer to being a farmer to being a cook, all these things you learn. And so um, I learned about things. I liked cooking as a child. That was, um, that was kind of a thing that I just did just to see I kind of created experiments that were kind of food. I just like, I made things. Um, but no, as far as being passionate about what you do, no. I think you have to be realistic. It's the number one thing that I see happening with businesses. Um, if you're going to go into business for yourself, you better enjoy being in business. Um, an example is I had a friend who loved to cook and she was determined to open a restaurant. And I said, you're not going to cook in a restaurant. You've got to be busy running a restaurant. There's, you know, so you have to be fine letting someone else cook or you need to get someone that's going to run the business. But if you're running the business, you're not cooking. Mm -hmm. um, if you have spent your life working, say you retire from uh, telecom, say you retire from 30 years, if you have spent that long working in a very structured environment, don't take your retirement and go start a business because mm. you're not wired for it. If you were wired for it, you would have left a long time ago. Um, I think being practical, love what you do. I, I, people ask, did I always do chocolate? No, I didn't touch chocolate until I was working with this client. I like it. I love desserts. I mean, I, if someone else was making it for me, of course I'd eat it. But uh, <laughs> if, if prior to working with um, my friend Charlie, I never even thought about making anything with chocolate. And I think that allows me to be objective um, and view it with enough distance that I can, I'm not married to anything. I can say, this is what it is. Um, is it good or bad? Is it profitable or not? Is it ethical or not? I can leave it at mm. that and because I have a healthy distance to it. Um, I think you should like what you do, yes. Um, but you have to be a passionate problem solver, being, uh, being in business, the processes, because you're gonna have to, if, if you have a large team, you're managing people. You're either managing people, managing uh, expectations, dealing with vendors you're dealing with all of that and so if that is what's happening you have to be clear you have to be able to step away and go this is the right thing to do regardless of how i feel about it this is the right thing to do um, and i think that gets a little shaky when you're so close to something mm. um, yeah that's a good point never thought of it that way but it, you know, it, great if you can if you can combine the two. But actually, sometimes oh, there's different value in actually not doing it through that, like you say, because you're not as emotionally yeah. invested. You, you're more focusing yeah, on the you, game rather than the the nitty gritty. Because what of, happens is there's nothing new under the sun. There are plenty of chocolate makers in the world. There are plenty mm. uh, of horse trainers in the world. Um, the world isn't at a shortage of much of anything, other than I think compassion. But um, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Touché. So I think you have to view it that way. The other thing that I find is that people, um, you know, in a, you don't go into business out of hate for a job. Like I've, I've known people that, oh, I, you know, I hated this job. I, whatever, whatever, I'm going to start my own thing. And I'm like, well, um, it's mm -hmm. not, if you're conditioned to a Friday paycheck, if you're conditioned to someone else providing your 401k, if you're conditioned to um, weekends off, 
if you're conditioned to all of those things, uh, you're nine to five, don't start a business. Um, right now I'm talking to you guys and I think everybody's downstairs having cranberry sauce and turkey. This is part <laughs> of my business. This is part of what I love to do. Um, and, and you have to know that. The other thing is that, um, going back to why I took the two years, I didn't want my decisions to be based on have to circumstances. So if you are, if you start a business and again, your mortgage depends on it, your car payment, your, um, your lights and all of the, if that depends on this business you just now started, um, that totally shapes your decision-making process. You don't mm -hmm. look at it objectively. You don't look at it from a risk, um, risk cost, uh, value standpoint. You're like, this has got to work. It's got to work. No, it really doesn't have to. <laughs> the business doesn't <laughs> care whether you, whether you need to pay the light bill today. It just doesn't care. So uh, I think that understanding uh, that this started as kind of a side thing. It really did. It started as, well, you know, I was looking for something else. Um, my, my home life was stable whether I did this or not. So that allowed me to to treat the business as it does. So I always tell people, you don't have to just stop everything to go start something new. Um, put yourself in a position that you can take it or leave it, that you can give it what it needs, not what you need from it. And I mm -hmm. hope, I think the success rate of businesses would be better if people thought about it that way, because then again, they also wouldn't be so married to, it's got to work. Again, if I if I was so married to the co-work space, I would probably be bankrupt and not in a home if I was trying to sell a space that wasn't selling because it was just not the right time. Had I waited three years, I could have been the next WeWork or who knows. But, you know, <laughs> but by trying, you, you can't force a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. So, yeah. so apart from the business skills uh, that you've mentioned now, which are plentiful, uh, what are the other sort of skills required to be a hand-making chocolatier? Um, patience. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a theme, eh? It is. Uh, <laughs> and I, think, I seriously do think that my skills and my, my habits as a horse trainer make it work well as a chocolatier. Um, mm -hmm. Chocolate uh, is temperamental. Very, very temperamental. It's also what we call making chocolate tempering because... Mm -hmm. Uh, temperature, uh, climate, uh, moisture, humidity, all of these things, time, just sheer time. There's some things that require, uh, if, if anyone ever asks why are bonbons so expensive, they take two to three days to make. They just do. You can't just turn it out. Uh, things have to set. They have to, uh, there are so many um, things you have to learn to eye. You have to learn to uh, guess or or feel or sense uh, pastry chefs talk about the uh, accuracy the science of it um, you can do the same process in chocolate every day and get a different result <laughs> so that is that's just the long and short of it and I think being able to so most chocolatiers are very passionate about it because that's the only thing that you're going to do uh, that will keep you through the frustration because you can't, um, to have a fine product, to have a high quality product, um, I mean, you can mass produce anything. I mean, you can put it in a machine and, you know, add enough chemicals to it and it'll all taste like food, even though it has nothing to do with food. Um, but to create something that's artisanal, um, that's of value, uh, that's ethical, all of those things, it takes a certain amount of passion and not so much passion to chocolate making, but passion to the entire process. Um, and I always talk about the why, the how will figure itself out. Um, I'm passionate about the, to me, the stories of the farmers, the lives of the people that make it. That's what allows me to continue and enjoy what I do because I, I see chocolate, but I also see all of the people that are, uh, involved in that process. And I think uh, to me that is important um, in how I do things. 
And, and Robert, you just sort of tagging off the back of that, uh, you're the board member of the Heirloom uh, Cacao Preservation Fund. Um, can you maybe tell us like what that involves, but also like, you know, how you source your own uh, cacao um, beans and stuff? Yeah. Um, what we do is there's about, I think there's 12 of us. We, we get together various times of the year, but there's about 12 of us that work on the sustainability, um, the sourcing, the ethics, uh, regulation, all of that of heirloom cacao. And so we travel all over the globe. Uh, random fact what about chocolate, it only grows at about 10 degrees north or south of the equator. So hmm. you don't have any chocolate that doesn't come with from somewhere around the middle of the earth. Um, hmm. And so that makes it very, again, it's temperamental. It likes tropics, I like tropics, it's a great <laughs> thing. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so it has to, uh, it only grows in a certain area. Um, most of the chocolate in the world comes from Africa. About 70 to 80% of it comes from Africa. Um, the rest is around the Caribbean, Central America, even in Vietnam and some of the Philippines. So it's kind of in that band. Um, we focus on what are the things that are affecting those people, what, from climate to socioeconomic to um, resources in general. And it made me, um, when I got involved actually doing research to be a consultant, it wasn't even that I was doing it for my business. I was just, oh, well, if I'm going to give advice, I might need to know what's going on. <laughs> and so uh, I started helping then and attending some conferences. And next thing you know, I'm on the board of directors. So it happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that to me, what I really wanted to know um, and just being completely honest, there's no place in the world that cocoa is grown that isn't brown or black people. There's not. And I know mm -hmm. that I'm also the only black person on the entire board. So <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. I said, well, then I want to know what's really going on on the ground. That's actually what precipitated me going to Africa myself and saying, I don't want to read reports. I don't want to hear, I mean, you know, I've, there was a spell, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a window of time in February of last year where I was reading the industry report, like the inside report, the BBC News and the American News. And there were three different stories about one particular incident. And I said, well, I trust my eyes better than someone else's. So I, in about a month's time, I planned a trip to West Africa and planned on staying in a and it worked and I'm glad I went. I really, I learned so many things, both good and bad or, or pleasant and not pleasant, but I learned and that definitely shifted, that trip alone shifted my entire purpose in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that I have access to um, and the ability to touch all of these people and all of these stories that the average chocolatier orders their chocolate from online, the chocolate comes in, you make something with chocolate. That's pretty much how it goes. Mm. Um, there are some bean to bar chocolate makers that, you know, oh, well, we found a co-op that sells beans and they ship the beans and again, make your beans, and make your chocolate. Uh, and then there's a group of us that literally go um, and talk to the people. We go to the rainforest, we go to the farmers, um, and have a face-to-face -face conversation and learn where um, where that product comes from and how that product is produced and what are the circumstances facing that farmer. And so I thought, well, again, I have this ability, I have this access to information, I have to do more than just go home and make a bonbon with it. And so mm -hmm. that shifted me doing more educational things. I do a lot of... Um, consumer education as well as industry education. I, te I train chocolate makers as well as I train consumers. And, and it's pretty, um, it's fun when you can bring a box of chocolate and then have a conversation about ethical sourcing and fair trade and slave labor and um, economics. It, you know, most, I don't know many other businesses that I can show up with a box of chocolate and talk to you about that and you not feel really <laughs> odd at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, I found that people are really receptive if you take the time to educate them, not yell at them. Uh, if, you, if you can take the time to share what you know, I think that's crucial. And, and 
I'm pretty wordy as it is. I like to talk, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I figure, you know, do something with that. Do something. Uh, so my, my team makes a lot of the chocolates. I still love that when I'm on site, I get to make and craft things, but I do a lot more um, research and education uh, training because that's my contribution to the sustainability. You know, there are a lot of things affecting chocolate now, climate change, um, lack of skills, lack of education, uh, just both whether it be on the farmer end or not as many people getting into uh, the beans, this particular method of making your chocolate from the beans and sourcing directly. So we work with that. And I can say that that whole process has taught me to look at how I get my things. And this ties back into what I learned from my grandmother with mm. how, um, what do I do with the beans that I have? How do I cultivate this? Am I preparing for the next crop and the next crop with this crop? Because I don't think sometimes that's even given any credence. I don't think people think about what's happening three years from now on this plot of land based on what I do today. And so um, wow. I try to share that. So, yeah. Jeez, that's, I hope that wasn't uh, too long of an answer, but yeah, that's, that's really why I do. No, thank you. We, we, we love that, that kind of sentiment. And, you know, it, it certainly harks back to the days on the farm as well, I guess, when there's that disconnect that most of us have of um, food on our plate versus where it comes exactly. from. And, you're obviously bringing that back into it. So thank you for doing that. I think education, when you start to delve deep, Gareth and I always, often talk about this, to delve deep onto a subject, it's just um, suddenly exposes so much more interesting facts about it. And when you educate someone about their food, I think it's very, very important and powerful. So, so thank you for doing that. But you've obviously got a lot of interesting tips and tricks and uh, you've also got uh, a, a key to success that we thought was great and it's walking afternoon naps and yoga so yes. how does uh, that fit into your life i've always taken naps always i don't care where i am or what job i've had whether it was a corporate job or whether it was training horses uh, about one o'clock two o'clock i'm taking about a 45 minute nap i just do um <laughs> and i can learn to sleep anywhere i mean when you're on the road you learn even if it's just stretching out in the back of a pickup and they're like, are you going to get in the bed? Yes, I'm getting in the bed of the pickup on a blanket and I'm just driving down the highway and I'm going to nap. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't appreciate it until the, until the days that I didn't get to take one. That's when I realized, no, you need to keep those. <laughs> um, it totally changes how I interact with people. But walking, um, most of my thoughts, most of my developments business-wise and planning happens while I'm walking. I, I hate sitting still. I mean, it's one of those when I'm traveling or when I'm training horses, you know, you're moving constantly. Um, and when I, re when I stopped training horses, I realized how sedentary uh, I had gotten or, or that the average person is. They, they sit just all day. Um, and in yoga, going back to patience, um, I, studied, I started doing yoga and Pilates when I was in college. I just didn't know that's what they were. Um, it was just warm ups. You're getting ready to dance, you stretch, you, um, you cool down, you take 45 minutes of just breathing. Um, that was part of my dance curriculum. I didn't realize that was a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm just like, it's what you do. You got to get ready to dance, you stretch, you breathe, you, you relax, you center yourself. Um, I think more people need to do that. I think we need to get out of our heads sometimes. I think we need to forget, you know, I, Everything is what you make of it. I don't care how bad the circumstances are, and there are some really crappy things happening, and then I don't care how good they are. If you stop and go, okay, how can I impact what I just saw, what I just witnessed? Because I don't think nearly as many things are happening to us as we'd like to believe. I think we, we uh, get involved in things, we get it immersed in things, and they become an extension of us when I'm like, is that really, really you? Or is that just something you fell into a habit of? Um, and so I always say yoga allows me to um, process and it's me time. And I think more people need that. I think you need to disconnect. I think you need to put the phone down, get away from the computer. And I like being outside. Again, I'm an outdoorsy boy. So it's like, if I can go out and just look and listen to the trees, 
I don't think people do that enough. <laughs> totally. You're speaking our language, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Robert, uh, what particular sort of skills and values do you think that you have, uh, which allows you to make a big impact or an extraordinary impact in life? Um, the ability to be comfortable in my own skin. I realize that there are a lot of people who are afraid of themselves and that's the best way I can put it. I think they're afraid of their, their abilities, their power, their vulnerabilities. I think people spend, a, spend so much time crafting the person that they present that they forget to just be. And um, I, I own my flaws. I own, you know, there are a lot of things for all the things that I'm great at. There's a whole lot of things that I'm bad at. And I'm sure my partner was, be the first to let me know what they are. Um, but I also realized that um, the pursuit of perfection isn't the problem. It's the fact that we assume we know what perfect is. And I don't think we do. And that's why we get into trouble trying to achieve it because um, that's not something we grasp. We know what symmetry is. We know what alignment is, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. Um, and I think, so my ability is to own my shit, I own it. You know what, there are things that I'm good at, there are things that I'm bad at, and that's okay. I don't, um, that doesn't negate what I have to offer. Uh, if anything, it enhances it. I think skill-wise, being able to share that, being willing to put myself out there um, is a vulnerability that a lot of people don't like. I think they don't want to be in a position to have people, um, criticize or judge or, you know, whatever. So I think a lot of people hide. I think a lot of people that have great talents and abilities hide out of sheer concern of stuff that doesn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I think my ability to just be myself, um, I think the, the ability to talk all the time, <laughs> I love to talk, so I that and be myself. Um, and I enjoy life. Like, I wish more people, like, life is to be enjoyed. Don't do bad crap to people and go enjoy yourself. And it's, I think um, there's so much to see and there's so, um, my, my life has not been void of, of obstacles or craziness. I don't, you know, kind of tying back into the conversation about growing up in the South. I'm a black man in America. I think I've been uh, stopped by the police 49 times. Wow. Oh. You know, I've been um, falsely accused of things. I've, I've seen these things happen. And, and that's what I, that's another thing I do want to bring up. I said, just my outlook isn't because I've not had adverse situations, not at all. My outlook is what it is in spite of the adverse situations. Mm -hmm. um, I refuse to let someone's small mindedness, someone's racism, their negative homophobia, whatever, that's their crap. That's not mine. And, and I refuse to let it shape how I see the world. Um, there's a great big world out there, a huge world out there. And I don't think people, uh, you know, if, if you worry about what's going on on your blog and, and maybe there's a, there's a bad dog that bites you every time you go by on that blog, go somewhere else. Maybe that dog can't go anywhere else. Maybe that's the limit of its chain and it can't do anything else. Who's at fault if I keep walking in that same direction and living mm -hmm. that same experience? I'm like, well, I'll just go to the right <laughs> and, um, and see what's life like over there. And then keep being, being present, um, keep making those choices. And I'm just, otherwise I don't sweat the small stuff. And there's a lot of small stuff out there. <laughs> It's so powerful. That's, that's probably related to the way you, you speak is probably in part how you ended up um, getting the award of uh, Black Enterprise Modern Man uh, or Men of Distinction, 100 Men of Distinction. Uh, that must, must have been quite an amazing uh, feeling having that. Yeah, that was one of those things when, um, again, you get you checking your email every day and, and that's not one of those things you're just like, oh, we would like to talk to you about this and you've been recognized. Someone had submitted me or, or it mentioned, I don't know. All I know is I got this letter and, and they sent someone out to do an interview. And, and I guess I'd never give a lot of thought to um, 
that I think coming from that, actually, that interview was why I started noticing just the ability to be. Because before then, I never gave much thought to this is just who I am. You do your things, you go about your day, but there are people watching and they're, um, and you can have an impact just by living your your experience. Not, it doesn't always require you to go give a speech somewhere. Mm. It doesn't require you to write a book. Although I am writing a book, um, it doesn't <laughs> require to write a book. Uh, it it is about just being, being real, uh, being approachable, being uh, tangible. I think there's so much in social media and the news that we. Um, we think is real, which isn't. Um, again, one of the first things you learn as a theater person, it's all manufactured. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I think that is the issue. I think we have gotten, there's a disconnect. I mean, we were of an age that we were around before the internet was created. And I think that's gonna be, it's very fascinating to talk to people who the internet was always there for them. Um, so, a lot of what makes me impactful is that, yeah, just, I live every day. Hmm. I, uh, I couldn't think of a, a better person to uh, start a new question that we're going to be asking our, our guests. And I think you're just the man to, to kick it off. So like, um, just before we do finish off, this is this, you know, what, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Being ridiculously human to me, is honesty. We have, um, instead of working on creating a perfect me or the me I want everyone to believe, I'm just me. And, and that means no shame of your mistakes. I'm not perfect. Um, I learn just as much from them as I do from everything else. I think being ridiculously human is, um, again, honesty. What is it that you want from life? Have you ever noticed that there are a lot of people who can't tell you what they want out of life? Mm. They don't ever stop and give a thought to what, what, what do you want? Why are you here? What are you planning to do? Um, what are you willing to give? And, and I don't think people spend enough time thinking about that. Um, we, we can tell you what kind of job we want. We can tell you that we want to make money or not, or we want, you know, we want to have these, exterior things that someone told us in some magazine that we should like but but really how many people can honestly answer that question what do you want to, what you know and so yeah that is my ridiculous human honesty you know with yourself and trans it's not even about the transparency because i think that's a buzzword right now where everybody wants to be transparent i'm like everyone doesn't need to know all of your business mm. Being mm. honest with yourself is very different from telling everyone <laughs> all of your business. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't share my dreams with everyone because if they're not trying to help it, I don't need, I don't need naysayers in my camp. I don't need um, obstacles. There's enough obstacles that exist as it is. So don't borrow trouble as a, my dad would say. So, you know, I focus on spending a lot of quality time with really good people. And I focus on spending a lot of quality time with myself. Love it. Well, we can certainly say we've just been uh, educated, but more than that, we've uh, totally just spent some time with a quality person. So thank, thank you, you so much for that. Listen, how do people taste your chocolate, get hold of you, what is the best way to get in touch with I'm, you and find out what you're doing? I'm easily followed on Instagram at Fine Chocolate Man. Can't miss that. Um, <laughs> my website is cocovivere.com. It's C-O-C-O-A-V-I-V-E-R-E.com. Um, but yeah, those are two of the easiest ways to find me. Um, and I do respond to my Instagram account. I think some people are like bots or whatever. But no, I do actually. And again, that's why I'm talking to you guys here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and I'm usually around. I, I do a lot of custom things. So I always tell people, if there's something you want or something you, you have an idea, message me. Everything that I do is made to order. There is nothing mass produced about what we do. So I kind of on that business model premise, I say, you know, Who's buying it? You tell me what you like, and that's what we create. I'm not here to tell you what to like. So, yeah. that's awesome. And and also, what uh, whatever you are coming up, you mentioned you got a book that you're working on. Is there anything else? 
Yes, I have. Um, that'll be coming out in the spring. I'm going to go on pre-sale tomorrow. It's called Bittersweet, and it's a cookbook actually. Uh, on it encompasses both the things that I've learned about the chocolate industry, as well as a lot of the sweet and treats that uh, I create for clients. I think um, it's a fun way to share that with people. And I can, you know, a cookbook doesn't just have to be pretty pictures and flour. It is, you know, the story about why you're making uh, what you make. And so I'm doing that. Um, again, I'll be doing the World of Chocolate in Chicago, Illinois on November 30th um, for um, the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. So we'll be raising money for that charity. Uh, yeah. I try to stay civically involved that way. Uh, I try to find things to do um, that I get to, hey, come taste the chocolate. Let's go learn about something. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. no, we just take a quick moment because I mean, we've just blown us away. Just so many yeah. transferable skills and so many interesting avenues and facts and um, real human uh, interactions that you've had over the years. And uh, just thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Uh, we've totally yeah. just had a great, great chat. And um, I think you're so much more than a, just a chocolatier. You know, you've, you've got so much uh, depth to what you do and the way you do it. So um, we're really Thank excited you. to see your book because I think it'll be a lot more than just, like you said earlier, just sweets. And that, uh, you know, that'll be really great. Uh, and um, thank you for today. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a blast. Um, I'm always, you know, excited to talk chocolate and, and all things. And so, so thank you guys. <laughs> and Robert, just from me, I mean, yesterday when I was kind of doing the research or a couple of days ago, like, you know, just trying to find out a bit more about your story, I promise you, I got so excited and I was just, and it was literally from reading like, you know, a few articles that, you know, you'd, you'd, um, been like asked, you know, questions. And I was like, this man is such a great story. And I messaged Craig and I was like, this is going to be a cool <laughs> chat. I just reckon yeah. that Robert has a lot of, I, I hope it was. I hope and, and, and it's, yeah, it's, it was. it's seriously, it's like, it's over delivered, like completely. And, and if I just have to sort of tag on to what Craig said, like that you just shared so much wisdom with us and mm -hmm. You've, you've lived such a full life and, a, and a, you know, a life that's full of lessons that you know, you, you've learned from your family and, and you've obviously taken on yourself and um, you've uh, taken in every single part of your own life. And it sounds like you're sharing all that knowledge now. And I, yeah. I just, uh, I feel like this, I've, I've just had such a great time talking to you and I've learned so much. It's, it's one of those chats where you just want to listen to it again because you know, that there's so much that you, you know, you would have forgotten, but you need to remember. Yeah. So thank you so much, you know, and then you've, you've got uh, such a great smile and personality. I, I, and I try to not everything smile. Like that. I, I smile. <laughs> it's like, it's impossible not to smile when you're smiling. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. And I can imagine that it's like in person, it's even more infectious. So. Um, and I think something as simple as that, enjoy yourself. Like life is, Life is amazing. It's, it's crazy and it's, it's sometimes difficult, but we get to live and we get to interact with people and, you know, we get to taste chocolate. Hey, you know, it's like yeah. we get, there's so many things to enjoy. Totally. Yeah. And, and that resonates so well with us. And actually Craig and I, we're busy working on like sort of, you know, the strategies and stuff for our podcast. And we've both written down a hell of a lot of stuff in terms of what we want to do. And then the last thing that we wrote, we wrote was like, we have to make sure that we keep on having fun because if we're yeah. not having fun, there's no point in doing this. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Cause it will read. They will see. Yeah. They will, if, if that is true. Now. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, cool. Turkey and cranberry sauce. Thank, thank you so much. Go and enjoy you, it. We appreciate it. All right. I hope to stay in contact, even podcast uh, sure. aside, cause yes. I want to go to Australia and I want to go to South Africa. So I'll have but to keep you guys we totally love that. That's part sure. of why we do this. Yeah. So, so like when we're in the States, yeah. if we're around, we're going to definitely hook you up. Always. Always. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Amazing. Thank you. Take care. Cheers, See you, Robert. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. 
Stop at the toll, digging for change Snowy Cape Fold Mountain Range 